Crouch. Bind. Set. Joe presents the House of Rugby together with Guinness. We go again. Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode nine of the COVID lockdown. You would think by this point we're beginning to get up up and running with our new technology, but I think it's fair to say we are as shambolic as we've ever been in p- piecing this together. Um, Hoff in place nice and early, Tyndall with the entire family destroying setup, and our guest this evening who runs a multi-million pound rehabilitation facility and has put together some of the most impressive fundraising you've ever seen. Doesn't even have Google Chrome downloaded on his laptop. Matt Hampson, I don't know how <laughs> the hell we've managed to even get you dialed into this, but we have, um, and it is a great pleasure to have you with us on House of Rugby. Um, you and your tech are, are quite something to behold, I think it's fair to say. Absolutely. First things first, how Absolutely. are you? Yeah, yeah, all good, all good. I've uh, d- dusted down the laptop and I'm ready to rock, so uh, yeah, I'm ready to good. rock and roll. It's yeah. very good to have you on. Um, I, I mean, these are extraordinary times for all of us. Um, how are these times for you? Um, obviously a little bit different because um, I normally have a team of 10 carers that look after me uh, 24-7, uh, but now I'm down to two because we're self-isolating. I'm very lucky to have a, a great support and a great network of uh, carers that are looking after me at the moment, and they're still staring at me. <laughs> Jackie was teaching us words I'd, I'd never heard before in, in setting you up a little bit earlier it's obviously a bit of frustration flying around at uh, Hambo <laughs> Mansion um, obviously you've, you've got two amazing carers but you know are, are you having to be particularly careful at the moment or are you just sort of cracking on as normal what, what's sort of the day to day for you yeah obviously I'm classed as a vulnerable uh, person with uh, being on a ventilator and things like that but I, I actually see myself as being quite lucky in a way because I have one, I've actually got a ventilator. So uh, in that way, yeah, very lucky in that way. I know it sounds uh, yeah a bit dodgy saying that, but um, yeah, I'm, I'm 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 very lucky to be well looked after and I'm being able to self isolate in in rural Leicestershire. So yeah, very lucky in that way. Lucky you in God's country. Um, Matt, it's a real, real pleasure and a privilege to have you on House of Rugby. Um, You know, most people within the game will obviously know you and about your remarkable story. Um, We have quite a lot of viewers who who tune into this but don't necessarily have a passion for the game. And it's worth just reminding them that obviously, you know, a a former Leicester Tigers tight head prop, um, but you had a a fateful day back in 2005 where you dislocated your C4 and C5 vertebrae in a training session with England under 21s. I know Hask was obviously playing that day. And I've mentioned to you in in the past, that I was actually a junior reporter at Sky at Franklin's Gardens that day as well. And, and Tins is obviously alongside Tins. What, what's your involvement with, with Hambo? Because you're, you've got an active interest uh, um, with his foundation as well. Uh, Yeah. I'm a patron of the foundation and, um, you know, been lucky. Well, not lucky because obviously we never wanted Matt to go through this, but you know, 2005, uh, we were in Six Nations business. Obviously, there was a lot of Leicester players there, and Matt was clearly uh, liked heavily by and thought of highly of all the players because I remember sort of the shockwaves going through when the news uh, sort of came through with Co- you know Cosa was there, obviously Mudos was there, uh, who else was there? Uh, Harry Ellis obviously was a good mate of uh, of Hambo. So yeah, there was it was immediately brought onto everyone's radar, and um, I think it brought home to all rugby players I, I don't think we've always said how good rugby is at getting behind its own and supporting it in times of tragedy you only have to look recently with Doddy Weir and Tom Smith um, I think Hambo was sort of that first where there was so much outpouring you know Hambo throws an event and you could list every rugby player under the sun that will turn up and that's just a measure of the man and and what Hambo's done uh, having gone through it so uh, it was a very uh, but I was very honoured the day that we got to open that get busy, get busy living centre and uh, and fulfil one of Hambo's dreams. Hambo, but the best thing about Hambo is the dream never stops there. It then goes to another dream, which currently is accommodation and a hydro pool. Um, obviously, COVID nineteen's put a bit of a spanner in the works there, but hopefully we can get it back up and running once once we can get back out and actually talk to people face to face. Um, you're obviously part of what is a very tight network at Leicester Tigers. Um, and there are so many things that, that I want to talk to you about and, and that we all want to talk to you about. I just quickly want to talk to Hask about how tight the Wasps network is this week. 
You are a fizzy can that is ready to pop. What's been going yeah. on in your WhatsApp group? Uh, well, first, it's great, to, obviously, to have Hambo on here, mate. It's great to see you. And um, I'm surprised you haven't tried to flog that ventilator and make a bit of cash out of it. Or at least if you've had, if you've had Jim Hamilton like renting it like fairground rides, you can have a go on it for 20, 10 quid if you want. Um, but look, uh, we had actually had our first complaint. Well, you know, I you know, well, cut the thing. So, you know, I said that every now and then I obviously talk about people on House of Rugby thinking that nobody listens to this, that nobody would actually listen to House of Rugby. And every now and then I get a little message, like someone I haven't spoken to for like 10 years going, oh, mate, I was getting all these uh, bombarded by people on social media. Uh, you know, I didn't realise what it was. And then I heard about it. You throw me under the bus. Ha, ha, ha. It's all jokes. I'm like, oh, we still friends? And I got a few of those emails after the bin juice. 15 shout out to, to, to tim foster who took it very well um nick defty's actually purchased the team bin juice hat uh which is which is great he's kind of very happy with that but there was one there was one player who's kind of misunderstood we had our first real uh, official complaint from an old school or old school rugby head i won't mention his name he's just known as clifford um he wasn't actually mentioned in any of the in any of the team which i think is a bit disappointed because if we're going to do a bad breath melted rig 15 he would have taken both centre spots, hands down. Um, uh, and also Crap Chat, Sevens team, he would have made it in all seven positions. So I'm a little bit concerned as to why he's got so perturbed about uh, about uh, House of Rugby. But the gist of it was, is apparently I only invite people on there that I can take the piss, that all the stories are stolen, um, and I was lucky to be around and I haven't achieved anything. So he got very upset. But unfortunately, he doesn't quite qualify as a legendary enough to invite him on House of Rugby. So, unfortunately, we're going to have to do maybe a second string mini pod with Clifford, the uh, the Listerine Dragon, as and when available. <laughs> what I love about that is there will be so many people who will go back to the archive and remember you talking about Clifford, the Listerine Dragon. Um, yeah. I reckon there'll be mere minutes before that person's name <laughs> is in the comments section. I actually woke up Saturday to a message from a, from a fellow, someone who actually got mentioned in Team Bin Juice. And I, and I should, I need to make an apology as well. Um, Johnny Barrett, who um, he basically told me to say this because he feels aggrieved that the, I only talked about him as being a friend of the show. But Johnny, what he wanted me to say was, He's the most undervalued number two that's ever been for Was. He should have had much more caps. He should have played, uh, you know, he should have played to hire a team. Probably was an England player that was overlooked. And he's a great player because he, I've got bombarded by messages from him saying that he felt undervalued as being only a bin juice 15. So no one's happy. If, 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 you, if, if you go on, if you go on uh, veterans rugby, he is world class. Now, in these veterans <laughs> games that we play, the England England Island game, no other hooker <laughs> ever turns up. And Johnny Barrett turns up every year and does eighty minutes and literally flogs himself. And he is everywhere. So he is world class and veterans England veterans. He is unbelievable. Isn't the definition yeah. of bin juice though that it is coulda shoulda woulda and there's not a lot of have done etc. Yeah. Yes, the whole the whole the whole concept is it that actually all these guys are, are heroes, that all the heartbeat of the team, they're probably the first people you want to go for a beer with in, in, in the squad. Uh, they're all great guys. Obviously, we had to fill a 15. But Johnny, I just think Johnny felt ag aggrieved because he did. He, he, I think he, he, he was at Wasp for 10 years, you know, 700 training sessions, one appearance off the bench, got yellow carded, never seen him, never, <laughs> never seen again. But he assures me that he he has to do more. And, and, his, and his lowest point was when one of his clients bought him an England rugby shirt out in Japan and um, made him wear it. And I turned up for a night out with Mike <laughs> after, I think you might have been there, Alex. And he was walking around in full England stash and he was trying to hide it with a denim jacket. And every time his client went, Johnny, do you, do you not like that shirt you're wearing? And he was like, oh God, having to take it off. So yeah, he's, he's had a bit of a stinker, but he's a hero and he is a friend of the show. He is a friend of the show. Well done, Johnny B. Um, Hamba, you, uh, coming back to you. Um, actually, funny enough, there was a very good documentary which I was watching, was it yesterday or, or I think it might have been this morning as well, with on, on rugby yeah. class, um, which big old Jim has been up to. I, I'm desperate not to sort of get you to tell it twice, and I, I'd love to sort of revisit some other bits over the course of this show as well, particularly with Hask, yeah. who was there that day, and Tins, who's so active in your foundation as well. Um, can I just sort of start at the beginning, though, with you? Why rugby? When did you get the bug? What are your sort of earliest memories of um, of the game? I think I was, uh, yeah, pretty big, hectic kid, pretty fat as well. So, uh, but 
Um, my mum and dad really struggled to uh, sort of control me, and um, started talking to a. They started talking to a friend in the pub, and said, "said We need to sort this kid out." And they said, "Oh, you've got to get them." get him along to rugby, I'll absolutely love it. And they took me along to rugby, I was five years old, and that's where it all started. I absolutely hated it, cried my eyes out the first session, <laughs> and then I, and I, and I uh, loved to, and uh, then I learned to sort of love the sport, and I love the, uh, the social aspect, and the, the uh, camaraderie around it, and yeah, the, the friendships, and, and um, I, d- I didn't really have much going for me, um, dyslexic, so I struggled at school, uh, just a, just an absolute nightmare of a kid, and yeah, I think rugby was sort of my calling, really, and that was that was it, really, so yeah, that's how it all started, and then, yeah, it evolved from there, really. Um, there's a lovely line in that Rugby Pass documentary where your parents look at each other, and I think it's your dad who says... He was a challenging child. I think they call him a likable rogue, which everyone knows is, in brackets, an absolute shit who we couldn't get a hand on. Um, yeah. I mean, was it quite a good place for you to be able to vent and to be able to sort of express yourself? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think the physicality of it and and just just sort of the, the banter around would be all the time as well. That was my sort of calling, really, I think, as well. Um, I think you it's sort of good good morals for life really it's good and it's very very much a, a leveler as well in rugby um it, it, i think it sorts out the the uh the shits in life really doesn't it what's <laughs> out there yeah the little shits in life and uh yeah makes it grounds you and uh, keeps you humble really as well that is the new motto for the new global game whenever it gets rebuilt and repackaged. Rugby sorts out the little shits in life. Um, Hask and Tins, I want you both to dive in wh- wherever you feel sort of um, comfortable because there are so many questions I know that, that we've all got. But I, I suppose the next question, Matt, is, is at what point you went from being a little shit who was sort of running around on the field and sort of enjoying it somewhat to someone taking you aside and saying, look, if you concentrate on this, you've actually got real potential in there. Yeah, I went to Syston Rugby Club and I played at Twickenham when I was 14 years old. The top, I think the Tigers were playing against the Barbars that day. And uh, yeah, I played, played at Twickenham and, um, and then I got the chance to achieve a lifelong dream to play for Leicester Tigers. So I went along to Oval Park, tried out with 200 odd lads and uh, was successful to be part of the Tigers Academy. And um yeah, I, th- I think the first year I was in the Tigers Academy, I really struggled. It was obviously a brutal environment. I think uh, Haskell knows that and Tyndall knows that. He heard about Tuesday Night Fight Club and uh, all that at Tigers. Tell us more about Tuesday Night Fight Club as a young guy coming through up the rails and, the, and some of the characters that were involved in Tuesday Night Fight Club. Yeah, I, I went along uh, to to uh, pre-season. I, I thought I'd go along to pre-season and it would be, you You basically get, get um, yeah, told what, you, what you're going to do and, and how things are, how things are going to sort of pan out for you. And no, nobody talked to me for the first sort of two months I was there. You almost have to earn your, <laughs> earn your, earn your stripes and um, yeah, very much, yeah, struggle with that. Uh, very brutal environment and then yeah Tuesday night uh, fight club was basically Jimbo kicking the crap out of people um, and then yeah we had a, we had a lot of guys got like uh, a lot of guys sort of scrapping on that on the, on the Tuesday night and we would probably move for about an hour and a half then they'd, ch- they'd split split us in half uh, on, the, on the pitch chuck the ball in the middle of us and just say, right, you're going to maul now for about an hour and a half and then we do a scrummaging session and then we go home. Amazing, So uh, that was basically yeah, absolutely no finesse at all and it was just basically just being tough and that was it and working hard and just being, yeah, being absolute mongrels really and uh, we had guys like Brett Deacon knocking people out left, right and centre as well. So, yeah, it was, uh, yeah, it was, it was tough, very didn't, tough. And uh, didn't Brett uh, Deacon have a didn't Brett Deacon have an unbelievable right hook, yeah. left uppercut, or was it a right yeah. uppercut, left hook combo? I think, 
the, it's the left hook, mate. It's the left hook. Yeah, it's the big uh, left. Brett, yeah Brett's uh, left left hook's uh, renowned. So, yeah. <laughs> I've heard that. Scary, scary character. Scary I'm character. Sure. Hambo, do you know what the best thing is? Is that when you've just told that story, you're like, you've made out as if that was the only thing. You could have gone to a nicer club. Should have come down to Wasps, mate. It was unbelievable. <laughs> we have a Tuesday night pina colada night. Then we went around to Lowell's <laughs> place. And then it was Wednesday night wine bar night. And yeah, we did a bit, you know, we used to, you know, what we used to do is just come forth in the, in the, you know, not tough anyone, lose to everyone during the season and then finish top four and beat everyone and just win. It's a lot easier, bud, than getting down there, getting filled in. <laughs> I know. Well, yeah, you you guys sort of used your brains rather than brawn, didn't you? So that was we we just uh, yeah, we, it was very very brutal. And I remember the first one of the first training sessions I had at Tigers. There, uh, Jono Jono was there, and uh, Alessandro to a like, he'd just come back from injury, broke through the line. We we're just playing touch rugby, and um, and Mudos ran. Uh, from nowhere and and moved us to just come back from injury and just spear tackle the world just basically took him out into his back and then Jono picked yeah Jono basically um picked up Mudos and uh, smacked him in the face and then Mudos swung for Jono and sorry swung for Jono and um yeah and then Jono laid him out and flat on the floor and that was one of my first training sessions and my eyes were yeah yeah, I'm scared. Scared, really. To be honest with you. Do you yeah. remember, Alex? Was actually, I, I read in uh, in Hambo's book. I read it because I did. Um, I did an interview. Who was the Who was the name of the author of your your book? Who ghost wrote it with you? Was it Paul Kimmich? Um, uh, Paul Kimmich. Yeah, where yeah. he wrote it. He didn't go ghost writer. <laughs> so Paul 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 Kimmich is is quite a scary guy. Like he's very, very intense. And so obviously, I did like a, a load of interviews for the book, and then I read the book as soon as it came out. I mean, it's a great bit where. If you imagine, so Hambo, so I was a little shit uh, on the other end, other end of the spectrum, but similar sort of characters like dyslexia, whatever. Uh, and we both, and I didn't realise this, but the first time we ever met was at I think at Castlecroft, where we got to share a room together. And, yeah, absolutely. And, and I think he was obviously at Leicester, Leicester Academy. I was at Wasser Academy. Can you just imagine? what Hambo would, we can find out now what the hell he thought. Cause I didn't realize this when I was reading the book and it quoted him of him and I sharing rooms <laughs> and him just looking at me going like, fuck, you know, I didn't even think people like you existed. Uh, but I mean, I don't know. What did you think when you first, because I think it was, it was amazing. Like I, I obviously heard about the kind of, um, the, the, the Leicester boys. I'd heard about the stories and everything else like that. They were like, obviously feared, unbelievable club, like, you know, amazing history, but they were all kind of tough, tough, aggressive guy. So when I got with <laughs> Shane and with Hambo and he had, those, it, even at that age, he had the old, um, the old ankle boots with a 22 oh, inch wow. stuff. Oh, high, 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 uh, high tops. Right. I think they were like, oh, I think they were like, with 22 inch high tops. And I was like running around <laughs> with white, white slippers. And I can see him just looking at me, like looking at his boots, looking at me, looking at his boots. It was a shot. I mean, what did you think? Cause it, it was mad. Don't hold back, Hambo. Don't hold back. Yeah, it's scary, really. Uh, yeah, but scary in the other uh, other end of the spectrum. Yeah, uh, how's uh, you, you went to uh, what school do you go to? Wellington, Wellington College. Uh, so you went to Wellington College, and I went to my local comp. Um, so <laughs> yeah, and I, do you know, do you know what? I'm, I'm, yeah, just from a very sort of normal background. I'm not, I'm not saying that I had it hard compared to a lot of guys. You know, I'm not, I'm not from a council estate by any means. I'm a, I'm a bit of a country bunking really. But um, yeah, and then, and then meeting Haskell. Uh, yeah, the the self confessed uh, archbishop of uh, Banbury. Uh, yeah, so yeah, we were very, yeah, very, very different characters. But we got, we got on pretty well actually, didn't we? We always yeah, got on well. And uh, yeah, always always had a good laugh along the way. It was quite yeah. You always had a story to tell. But I think I think we had a mutual sort of respect for each other, really, in that way. You you were grafted, you know, and uh, yeah, you you always grafted and maximised your true ability. And um, I, I think we, as Leicester boys, uh, respected that. Um, <coughs> but yeah, obviously, very very different characters. But we we sort of hit it off really. I, I see it. It was it was good, Hask. Hask. It was good that you got him at that time before he'd formed the Leicester clique that would have come later on. You see, you you were in there before he he didn't know anything but the other guys who played for Leicester. So you 
and managed to devour and conquer before that created. I did, because normally they only share room with each other. So I somehow got segued in because <laughs> it was only under 18s. And then I sort of broke him down. But you can see as, as we went through the age groups, a lot of the guys, especially the Leicester boys, well, I would say stuff and they wouldn't want to laugh because they were like, we're not laughing at this posh dickhead from Wasp. But you could see him like turning away, like sticking forks in their legs, like don't laugh, <laughs> don't give them any unnecessary attention. But I always got away with all because... Because I think at that age, exactly what, what Hambo says is that rugby is kind of a leveler. If you, you know, people always talk about, um, you know, as fans, people come up to you and go, oh, I'm sorry, I'm a Saracen supporter. I hope you don't mind, or I'm a Leicester supporter. And I've always said, I've never had any uh, concerns about someone's club. It doesn't it interest me. If they're good people, they're good people. And, and you know, Hambo, uh, I got like a house on fire to, you know, from the, from, from the first moment, both working hard, both physical. Obviously, you know, I think but very much like, you know, what, what, um, what Hamburg's saying, you know, going to a club like Leicester and go, going to that intense environment, I genuinely don't think I would have got through it with my, with my, you know, mental strength. I think, you know, that was a very tough thing. I think Wasp was, 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 was tough, but in different, in different ways. So I think I had a lot of respect. And when you used to hear about what they used to go up to, I just was, it was leave me terrified and I wasn't even part of it. Matt, the, the question I want to, want to ask you is, do you look back now and I, I presume you were coming through the, the likes of, was it Garforth was there, Julian White? Certainly would have been around the club, Roundtree, Cockrell, West. I mean, some pretty heavyweight names, particularly that Leicester front row club. Do you look yeah. back now and, and think the days of my, those were the days of my life? Or do you look back and think, do you know, actually, I, I bloody hated it all? Um, I, I absolutely loved it. Uh, I think I, I think because I, I didn't really have any talent in rugby at all. I just... I, did, I just did, I just worked hard and I just wanted it and I just wanted to be the best I could possibly be. I was a fairly big lad for a prop forward, probably could have been a bit bigger. And I was I was still a baby face, still a pup, really in that in that world. But um yeah, Darren Garforth actually took us um, took us on in the academy. So he, he would come along on a on a Tuesday night and do a live scrummaging session with us. Um, and then, obviously, I went over to Nuneaton um, to learn learn my trade. There, uh, played there, and then, and uh, yeah, played played a bit on loan at Nuneaton. And Daz Garforth was there, and he used to start himself. He was one of the coaches. He used to start himself in front of me every week. <laughs> and I, yeah, but uh, uh, you know, rightly so. He, he was an absolute monster and a scary guy. If you speak to any of the and anybody from Leicester Tigers, he, he is a sort of man like Martin Johnson. He he would have ultimate respect for someone like Darren Garforth. And um Why? And was, what was it about him? Because you never heard a lot about him. He didn't talk a lot, he never did much media, certainly didn't wear white boots. What was it about the man that sort of set set him apart? I think he just set the tone. Uh he was just he he uh apparently I got told this story that he was a twice he's a scaffolder. So he um, he cut one of his hands really bad. He had like a laceration in one of his hands. And that was the morning for a game. And then he rocked up at the game and, and carried on playing. But he played that, he played the game that afternoon. And this is obviously in the amateur period. And um, <laughs> and he was really, really struggling. And everyone was like, what's the matter with him? And he, he was called Skin. Skin. And that's, that's his name. So everyone called him Skin. <laughs> And that was, uh, he was just like the main man. It, he was, I, I don't know, he just set the tone and uh, he just led from the front. And he was, yeah, I think he was uh, one of the first modern day prop forwards. I know it sounds a strange thing to say, but he could do everything. He had he had an uh, amazing skill set as well as just being absolute mutants as well. <laughs> yeah. Hey, I, I played a game with Skin in, in, I don't know whether it might be 99 or whatever, and for some reason, the ball was kicked off and it was always the number eight. And I caught it and I ran straight head first into a brick wall. I was 21 at the time, straight forward into the f full front rows coming to tackle me. And literally just ran as hard as I could, head down. And literally I got up, they put quite a good shot on me. And Skin just looked down and went, you could be a forward. I love that. And <laughs> just ran off in the middle of the game. Yeah. And I was like... Mm. Yes, I've got the respect to God. He's not going to fill me that's, in at any point. Yeah, that is. Uh, yeah, that's that's good. To have that respect <laughs> from someone like Darren Garforth. Yeah, 
Yeah, that's a badge of honour. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Matt, to sort of move it on a little bit, what kind of a? I mean, you were talking about being being a little shit as a kid. What kind of a person were you breaking through into that Leicester Academy? What, what kind of what kind of a what kind of a person were you on on course to be? Kind of thing. And and I sort of it's a setup because I remember reading a, a line in in uh, I think an article or whatever it was where actually and we'll come on to it. But you said the. The accident that you went through was was totally transformational for you as a person. You you feel you've ended up in a much nicer place now as a person. I just wonder, therefore, what what kind of a person you were, you know, as a kid in the academy, as part of that Leicester setup. I think when I initially went and joined the academy, uh, I struggled the first year I was there, but I, I really really did struggle, and um, I've got, I've, I got a bit. I would say I wouldn't say as strong as being bullied but I, I did get a lot of uh, yeah got got the piss taken out of me a lot of the time they they called me um, they called me Sack because I was so bad at SAQ but then they named me <laughs> Sack so I was just like so it's uh, yeah I was I, I used to yeah like step stepping the ladders and things like that and um, and yeah just get all my feet tangled up in those and then stepping all the cones out I just yeah, really, really struggled, and uh, and then Dusty did a review of me, Dusty. Yeah, uh, and uh, we we had a review of the of you know my my skills and whatever at the end of the season, <laughs> and, uh, and that was at Wolf Road. And he sat sat in the stand with me, and he said, "Amber, you need to you need to be tough. I want you to be ruthless. I want you to be absolutely ruthless. I don't want, I don't want you to ever take a backward step. I just want you to be leave from the front. I want you to be like Darren Garth or um, Julian White and characters like that. I want you to be the hardest you can be. I, you know, your skills don't need to necessarily be good, but I just want you to leave from the front and just be absolutely ruthless. So... Yeah, so I took that on board, and then the second season, it was yeah, yeah, game on. Really, I remember, I remember hitting a scrum in the uh, Oval Park, and the scrum collapsed, and I stood up and went toe to toe with my opposite number. I looked over my shoulder, and Dusty Hair ran off the sideline, and he was scrapping alongside me in this academy game. Yeah, so <laughs> yeah, great, crazy times, but it was uh, yeah, very much uh, focused on that. And then I think, to be honest with you, yeah, a bit of a lovable rogue, really. I think, um, yeah, that wasn't that didn't come naturally to me. Obviously, uh, to be ruthless and be be tough. But how, how did uh, you do that? I mean, how do you make that change? Is that talking to people who've been there and done it, or is it just a, a mindset? Is it are there people that helped you with that? How do you go from being lovable rogue and perhaps you know not feeling it's your natural habitat to I'm going to dominate this. Yeah, you just got to step up and just make it, yeah, just be as tough as you can be and, uh, yeah, just be as ruthless as you can be and, and learn your trade and, and try and be the best you can be um, scrummaging-wise and try and be, the obviously, the cornerstone of the scrum as well. And, um, yeah, I think, well, at Tigers, uh, there was very much um, a lot of emphasis on the scrum, uh, especially a tired prop. So just focus on, first and foremost, Scrummaging well. Second, be a good good support lifter in the line out, and then hit every rook, hit every maul, and then then on from that, be a ball carrier and make your tackles. But yeah, they were they were sort of like down the bottom of the the uh, tick list, really. Could you uh, switch out of it as soon as you stepped off the pitch? Obviously, if it's not your natural way of feeling. It- <laughs> You forced yourself to do, but then did it? You feel that obviously hanging around with the likes of Garforth, uh, Roundtree, they're quite intense both on and off the field. Uh, obviously, uh, Skin has a bit more humour off the field, but then so did you find it then stayed with you off the field, or did you have that switch that you could just relax as soon as you stepped off? No, we we used to obviously train hard, but also play hard as well. So we'd go off the field and then we'd go out. Uh, into Leicester and yeah, have a few drinks and have another know. fight. <laughs> yeah, it was a little bit like that sometimes, and, and you know, I'm not really condoning that, but it's um, yeah, that's that's where it was. It was it was very much like that, and uh, you had guys like Brett Deacon and uh, 
<laughs> and uh, Harry Ellis and even like Ollie Smith and guys like that as well, you know, who, yeah, wasn't always uh, wasn't always pretty, but that's just the way, way it was really. And we, we, I remember playing my first academy game away and um, just he gave us a crate of beer on the back of the bus on the way back from Coventry and Jimbo, Jimbo was smoking a cigar in the middle of the back seat. Uh, yeah, so, and that was, he was, you know, 18 years old. So, you know, looking at that, <laughs> it, it, was, it was crazy. It's like now, it's, it's just completely changed the game and it's like professionalism, rightly so, should be there. But we were, you know, very, very different that way. <clears throat> Hambo, did you ever try and take the back seat on the Leicester bus? Yes, I did, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, how'd uh, that go? Not very well, yeah. <laughs> Fly, Julian White's flying headbutt was, uh, yeah, quite scary. John O was in the middle. Um, yeah, Neil, Neil Back, he, yeah, just absolutely crazy. You, you watch these guys grow up and winning, winning World Cup trophies and and be you know being legends of the game and then you you sort of training again um alongside them it's a yeah pretty scary pretty uh, scary environment really imagine getting headbutted by headbutted by julia white it's like getting head by a stegosaurus <laughs> <laughs> triceratops yeah. straight in the face <laughs> <laughs> it's come from the uh, headbutt's come from the Jurassic era. Jesus, yeah. he, was, he was actually interesting. You know, Julian White was another guy that that again uh, I thought because obviously when I met all these, but I'd heard all about these people. Like you know, Darren Garth. I, I'm not, I, I think I met a couple of times. That didn't really get to know. Obviously, Wig was um, was was England coach for for a long period of time, scrum coach, and then an England forwards coach. I, I mean, when you talk about Leicester training sessions, uh, one of Wig's. Uh, Graham Roundtree's introductions to England forward development was something called Mall Touch, probably the worst game <laughs> ever invented. So when we're, when we're having a warm up, all the lads like you know want to get their hands on the ball, want to play. That's the modern rugby. Oh no, right? We're going to play touch, and when he blows a whistle, we set up a mall. Funny enough, he was never off the fucking whistle. He was like, a, honestly, someone thought the kettle had boiled. He was whistling, whistling so much. We, it was like mall, mall, and it was like. Obviously, like being a back row, I was like, yeah, I'm mauling, like pushing with my hands. He's like, no, you know, yeah, John Wells, right, get that under there, knock it. Right, any like warm ups would just fall on, fall on violence. So that was always quite a scary, a scary place to be with, with, with people like that. Just as yeah, an aside, Matt, could, could, can you mark Hask's John Wells impression out of 10? It, to, to me, it's, it's right up there as a 9.75. Oh, absolutely, absolutely, yeah, yeah, yeah. John John Wells, another scary character. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, apparently, uh, just all, all, all with Wellesley, sorry, they, they, they once found a video of Wellesley playing, and this is the greatest moment ever. Obviously, like a hero, like a Leicester legend, John Wells, you know, one of the probably, one of the best technical coaches I've ever worked with, the breakdown stuff in, in terms of, like, again, you know, getting the boat most out of players. Like, I think sometimes... Um, you know, players need that kind of, you know, you see it with young players. They talk a lot about like technique and wanting to be big and wanting to be all, you know, all these things, but mindset is such an important element. And it, you know, sometimes you can't, you can train all you want, but if you don't want to hit someone, you don't want to hit someone. You've got to really have that mentality. And I think Wellesley was brilliant at that and, and some of the technical areas, but they found a video of him once playing. Right. And he'd always said to me, he was like, right, James, if you come off from a warm up when you're bleeding, you know, that's a good warm up and ready to go. Right. And I had to get stitches once in a warm up, And he was like, that's unbelievable, James. Great work. And then we, well, I couldn't understand He's why. why... Jimmy <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> he basically showed a video, and apparently, John Jono told us, Martin Johnson told us that he used to turn up to training with the same sodden rugby boots caked in mud. Right? He used to put his feet in bread bags. Right, put his feet in like, like, like Hovis bread bags, put them in the boots. He used to wear a jumper with three ducks on it, same jumper. And there's a video footage of him running or playing, and there's a breakdown, and he just dives over the top of the breakdown, no skill, gets on the floor, gets sued, gets sued out the back of it, and then everyone's like, well done, Wellesley. That was it. That was the highlight reel, just him getting filled in, <laughs> and, and no one could get him off the ball, because obviously back in the day, he just fell off your feet. He was like, right, I've got them all. Mate, it was mind-boggling, mind-boggling. But what a, mate, what a boy, what a man. 
Sorry, he played rugby in a jumper with three ducks. No, on. no he used to train. So, so he used to train. He used to train in a, in a, in a jumper with. This is what John O told us: red bags on his feet, mud like boots were never clean, and three ducks on a, like an old Christmas jumper or whatever, like a woolen jumper, or whatever it is. Every training session, but he wasn't. Luckily, he wasn't re- representing Leicester. But they found old footage on an old magic lantern, an old slide thing, or whatever it was of, of him playing. And it literally just <laughs> ran in, ran in, dived over the top, head first, got filled in. And I was like, that was the highlight reel. I was like, is that it? <laughs> it was like, that's what you need to be, Hask. More, you know, more bash, less bash. <laughs> <laughs> Always thought Leicester was a special place, but my word, that is, that's taking it to the nth degree. Um, I need to pause. I need to pause for some breath and to get some of the blood out of my head. Um, so we're going to take a quick sort of mid-show trail. Um, and while we do that, we'll just remind everyone you are watching and listening to House of Rugby on Joe together with Guinness. With me alongside uh, Haskin Tins and the legend that is Mr. Matt Hampson. Still to come, we're going to talk about Matt's foundation. I actually wrote this down as the Get Busty Living Centre, but that's, I imagine, uh, something a little bit different. That's, we'll, that's, we'll get get busty. that's just lockdown for so long, isn't it? <laughs> oh, no. It is a yeah. busy living centre. Can I invest in the Get Busty one, please? I'd quite... <laughs> <Is> that... <laughs> You can be our ambassador for that. Um, Yeah, the Get Busty Living Centre, which is a little bit different to Hambo's fantastic Get Busy Living Centre. For now, though, let's just quickly remind you of last week's House of Rugby short, uh, where we spoke to the BT commentator Alistair Eakin on a variety of issues, including Hask's outrageous rant the uh, week before, uh, in and around the game. Uh, And he also picked up on how rugby might look when life gets back to normal. Have a listen to this. I don't think for a minute that we'll go back to what we had because I think that's completely unrealistic. It's unreasonable. And, and I don't think it would be a good thing either, by the way. Not that it wasn't great. But actually, if you look at the foundation stones of rugby, they're not great. Or they haven't been anyway, in terms of the numbers uh, and the money. So if they don't take this opportunity, if administrators don't take this opportunity to reboot to some degree, then I think it will be a failing on, on their part, on the sports part. We have to look at things like player salaries. We have to look at what's reasonable, what is sustainable, what is what is going to make sure that we actually have a sport in two years' time, five years' time, ten years' time. Because I don't think the model that we have, certainly in this country, is, is sustainable at all. And at some point, it was probably going to go pop, or various clubs were going to go pop, at some point anyway, this may have just accelerated that process to the point where the focus is total. And hopefully there are lots and lots of very clever people, much cleverer than you or I, who are going to come up with various different solutions that can help us on our way. But I think everybody has to be realistic and, and that will involve the players being realistic about what they can be paid. You're watching the House of Rugby on Joe, together with Guinness. That was Ali Eakin on uh, last week's House of Rugby Shorts. Look out for episode three on Thursday, both on podcast and YouTube as well. Um, and that's where you can find all of our episodes. Hours and hours of fun for you there, whilst we are all staying inside and staying at home. Don't forget as well our Facebook group. We're nearly up to 40,000 members in our face group, Facebook group, which is remarkable. Uh, and you can join in the conversation there. Check out our Instagram as well, at Rugby Joe, where you can find photos, news, and behind-the-scenes bits and pieces. Um, actually what is quite interesting some very interesting points from Ali there but that does set up next week's show very nicely it's the presentation of Hask and Tin's homework from a couple of weeks ago uh, you've had a month to prep what you would do with the game moving forwards Tins, you, you actually you gave me a, a sort of a, a call and a synopsis it, we're going into some detail you've, you've you literally planned it from root to branch James how's your homework been going please I haven't had anything uh, on my yeah, desk look, yet. I, 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 I think there's been a real misunderstanding about my role in this <laughs> podcast. I make huge, grandiose, unsubstantiated statements and don't back it up with <laughs> any substance or do any homework. <clears throat> I will. I can honest to God say the chance of me preparing anything apart from that on for, for a bit of homework is pretty remote i don't think i i mean obviously it's a podcast i just put my finger up i realize we're not we know we're a visual show and everything else but everyone's gonna think what was that i really can't be bothered lads to do a load of homework can't i just go with what tin says because this is where we this is where we should bring hambo in because he actually is a full-on rugby norse he's still oh. a full-on rugby norse goes and watches leicester train does stuff with the, the yeah with the scrums goes just goes to watch leicester scrummaging train. who does that as a, as a proper prop, prop, isn't it? If he goes to still watch a scrummage session 
Yeah, but <laughs> Hambo was without a, without a shadow of a doubt the biggest nose at that age, and loved like full, like all the nosy bits that normal noses don't like. There's there's even like a group of noses that we put off by how nosy Hambo is. Like they'd be like, "Whoa, man, you need to calm down." <laughs> what I do want to do is get back to you, and and obviously we're going to come on to you know your foundation and the amazing work you've done there. But are you happy? Do, do you mind if we ask you a little bit about March two thousand and five and I suppose the, the question is, you know, how often do you think about that day now? Is it is it gone for you or is it something that you find yourself reflecting on? Yeah, it seems, it obviously seems like a, a long, long time ago now. Um, I think before, obviously, rugby used to, used to define me. Um, I don't think rugby defines me anymore. Um, I think that I have other, other things that I've obviously done and achieved and it's not for me. I think before rugby was everything, and it was a be all and end all. Um, now, sort of see that the bigger picture, see people from all walks of life, all different sports that have had serious injuries. There's a lot more to me now than what there was before. I was obviously 20 years old then, so you, you're still growing as a person, aren't you? Um, but. Yeah, I, I would say that, yeah, my life's obviously changed dramatically. And like, I, like as I've always said, that this did happen for a reason. And that's to obviously set the foundation and help other people and, and uh, try and help them create a niche and a, and a purpose once again. It's funny, isn't it? Because normally, no, sorry, Alex, normally people never want to see as a referee Tony Spreadbury. They always feared getting spread as a referee, but actually, are you like best mates now? Because ultimately, he, he made some big calls there for you as well, didn't he, that day? Yeah, absolutely. He, uh, yeah, he obviously saved my life that day. And, um, yeah, I think that was obviously fate. And, uh, yeah, I don't I don't speak to spreaders enough. I wish I could speak to him a little bit more, but he's obviously got his own life and, and things like that and you know I, I was just so so fortunate to have spreaders there on the day to to resist me and um yeah make sure that i'm not well make sure that i uh, stayed alive really do you have any recollection memory sort of of it or is it something that a lot of people when they go through a trauma like that it sort of disappears from from the memory bank yeah i remember um Hitting the scrum, scrum collapsing, and then I was on, everybody was on top of me, and then people like got off me one by one, and I said, I can't feel my arms and legs. And then I remember waking up in the ambulance, and I remember having my shirt cut, uh, cut off me. And I remember thinking, this is my England shirt. You know, like back then, Stash was pretty important. <laughs> Stash was king. Oh, Stash was king. Yeah, so, yeah, Stash was really important. And I was having my England shirt cut off me. And, uh, you know, part and parcel of being a rugby player, it, the guys know he's, he's being injured. And I realised the true severity of my injury. And, um, yeah, and then I was, yeah, carted off to Northampton General. And then I just remember waking up in Stone Mandeville Hospital in intensive care in like a in a blacked out room really on my own. And um yeah, just not realising how yeah, still how how uh, serious his injury was and how it's gonna change my life forever, really. Hask, what do you remember of the day? I remember it I remember it quite well actually, um, because I've, I've always said this, I think, you know, especially what well, Hambo said about rugby, you know, when you're in rugby, we, we, you know, you think it's the be-all and the end-all. And I think, you know, uh, what, what Matt's achieved uh, for himself and for other people is kind of, you know, um, mind-boggling, really. And also, I, I always thought to myself, you know, if I'd been in a similar situation, I don't think I would have applied myself, uh, you know, with even 10% of his kind of dedication, grace and like success and what he's done. Um, but, you know, that's just an aside. But I, I remember the day quite well. I remember the first, we started off uh, with some sort of either, it was either mauling or some breakdown stuff. And um, Hambo Shock had had a fight with that, with Daddy Koo, uh, Michael Cusack. And we were like doing some stuff, basically, <laughs> You like you know like obviously what Hambo had said you know Dusty had basically said to him listen uh, you know don't back down so Daddy Koo, both two big gentlemen and they were having a scrap and we basically carried on and normally like a scrap finishes 
But these two blokes were just windmilling each other, but they got so tired yeah. that basically they were like forehead to darb, knackered. And and, and not normally we like, what a journey to I don't remember. Yeah, they had one on each other, right? And yeah. they were kicking off, and it was a lot of like, fuck you, no, fuck you, no, fuck you, right? Hitting. And, and it got like so awkward that normally, like, a coach like would break it up. But we're like, is, is anyone going to do this? And someone just went, don't worry, lads. They'll punch themselves out. And they were just <laughs> nasty, right? <laughs> Then, and they, like one of the hamburg was in a tackle suit or goose, and they came back. They were like <laughs> shattered, right? And then we moved on to we moved on to scrummaging, and basically we were doing the we were doing the scrums and standard like you know because obviously it's different different mentalities at that age, like different stuff. Is that what what Hambo said? I didn't realize that that's what the conversation you'd had about the way you wanted to play. Because you, when I think about it now you didn't ever take a backward step. You know, we're doing a scrummaging session, and it's like the back row are down on the scrum. We're like, who can be asked with scrums? Like, we've got to, we've got to, you've got to, you know, go down. Because props back in the day, the, the forwards coach would always say to the prop, right, listen, get into the flankers. So every time I go down next to Hambo, he fucking hit me on the forehead. I need your hask. I need you. Hit me on the ear. I was like, I get it. I get it. I'm going to push. Shut up. They're like, well, we need you. We need you. We're like, fine, 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 fine. Right, right. And you never did. Yeah, never did. I never did. <laughs> never, right? So we went down for the, went down for the first scrum, and they're like, it was supposed to be, you know, obviously like um, it was like full on scrums, but you know, the the front rows boys were having the gnaws off. You could see, and I, I remember saying like getting up. I don't know who was playing number eight at the time because I was on Hambo's side. I remember just looking at going, these guys. Are so, I think I use the word such nauseous, right? Went down for the went down for the next scrum, and I think uh, what I remember, Hambo went in, went in and like down. And obviously everyone, because like props always go on the floor. Like I would always like shudder a bit when, when scrums collapse because you're just thinking, oh, you couldn't pay me to, 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 to do that. And as I remember, everyone peeled off and Matt was, was lying on his side and hadn't got up. And normally we're like talking and boys like gene each other up, come on. And he was like, it wasn't getting up, wasn't getting up. And I heard him say, because uh, someone let down next to the doctor's like, are oh, you right, Matt? You're right, Matt. And he went, I can't, I can't feel my legs. Right. And a few people heard it, but not everybody, but I heard it really clearly. So I was like, what the fuck, you know? And we started, and everyone said, right, lads, step away, step away. And I was hovering around. And then about, I don't know, it must have been probably about 30 seconds to a minute later, I heard him or heard him say, uh, you know, like he's struggling to breathe a bit. And then we got basically ushered away from him and carried on doing line outs across the other side of the field. And obviously they didn't want to, they didn't want to panic us. And we're doing, going up for line outs. And I looked over because I was at the back of the line out. Even then they didn't throw me the ball. And I, t I turned around and I saw, Tony Spreadbury doing CPR. And we're like, obviously we're all, you know, 19 year old lads. And, and you know, Hambo was a massive part of, of everything we did. We were all tight knit. You know, you, you're, when you're those under 19s, you know, you basically play, you know, six nations games, but you're, you know, you're traveling all around the country, all to different places, all going on night off, you know, nights out after games. You're having the same camaraderie you have with the club, but you know, you're, you're representing young England, you know, you're, you, that's what you want to be, want to be doing. And sort of said, look, what is going on? And they can they can the session, but they wouldn't tell us anything. We didn't know what what the story was. And Matt Cornwall was kind of was Hambo's best kind of best mate, and probably still his best mate. I don't know, but but was basically the real conduit for us because we always went back to the hotel and everyone's sitting around like shocked, like what what, what have we just seen? Is Hambo okay? You know, he didn't really have mobile phones, or if we did, they were the Nokia thirty three tens or whatever. You know, there was no nowhere contacting people properly. And basically, we were drip drip feeding news. And I remember Matt coming back to the hotel or telling us at the hotel probably about eight o'clock that night listen he's broken his neck this is what's happening there's a, a, a really important period now with surgery and there's swelling and they can't tell it's going to be a waiting game and we basically then sat around and had i think in the following days a couple of meetings did we you know did we want to play the game you know did we what, what did we want what did we want to do you know and basically the consensus was knowing matt as the character being the absolute rugby nose he was and how it was so important for his life. He was like, no, he'd want us to play. He wouldn't want anything to get in the way of what we're doing. So we each, we had his initials on our shirts um, for, for that game. And we played against Scotland and we absolutely filled the Scots in and, and, and won and won that game. And, and just obviously through Matt Cornwall, we got the, the, the consistent updates of his, of his kind of journey. And it was such a, for such a dangerous sport. There have obviously been other injuries like it, but Matt was kind of the first high profile. And it was so interesting to see how underprepared rugby was for an injury of that nature and how, because of Matt, for so many people, me personally, it's changed the way I look at life, changed the way, but also it's changed the sport and the recognition about what was required. Because, you know, if Tony Spreadbury hadn't been there, 
uh, you know, I think it would have been a very different story for Matt because we didn't have spinal boards out in training. There was no way to get Matt from where we were on these bottom pitches in Northampton to where he needs to be quickly. There was no buggies. There was no oxygen. There was no, none of this stuff. And if Tony Spreadby literally hadn't saved his life, I mean, I don't, he, w- he wouldn't have been here today. And that was a real wake-up call to every rugby club that this is a severely dangerous game and that we need to, to change the way we approach things. Amazing story. It's amazing sort of hearing hearing you you tell it that way. I mean, I, I mentioned earlier, I remember being the, um, it was probably about the first or second year I'd ever done any reporting at Sky and I'd, I'd watched the training session and left three or four minutes sort of before the end of it. And I think I think before, before the moment we're talking about. And I remember going to the car to set up for the interviews and Pete Druitt, do you remember Pete Druitt, who I think was the manager, yeah. came sprinting past. And I said, oh, you know, sort of literally having seen him 30 seconds before saying, God, you, you know, you're in a hurry. And he, I, I will never, ever, ever forget um, the look of absolute just terror on his face. And I, I it's sort of, it, I remember it just unfolding from there. But it's interesting you remember that game um, and, and you played, and I, I reported on the game, uh, whatever it was, the Friday night, I think it was. And I remember interviewing Tom Reese, who I think was your captain at the time, or certainly was player of the match. Um, and I, I would honestly say to this day, it's the most emo- emotional post-match interview I've ever done. And I just, I, I just remember sort of, the, the huge impact it obviously had on, on on you as a team, but but for you, Matt, I I, I mean inevitably, it's, I don't mean it to be a sort of a, a rubbish question, but in, inevitably there's some really shit days that follow off the back of that. Um, <clears throat> can, can you remember sort of, I suppose the, the the worst of those kind of moments? And I, I wondered how long that had lasted before you managed to turn the situation around and and to say to yourself, you know, that there is good that's going to come out of this. Yeah, uh, I think being in intensive care, in and out of consciousness, um, being, yeah, on heavy medication as well, so sort of surreal dreams, uh, but very, very vivid. I can remember them to the day. Uh, yeah, I obviously wrote about them in my book as well. And um, and then going up to, going up to uh, the high dependency ward after intensive care and then lying there and um, thinking about the people in wheelchairs just thinking god look at that poor guy in a wheelchair because I, I didn't know anybody in a wheelchair so i'd never i'd never really been exposed to disabled people before my accident um so yeah i've seen people from the walks of life uh, in wheelchairs that Different, with different injuries and just and just seeing and just thinking god look at those poor guys really and and actually i was in a lot worse situation than they were there uh, i was i was a lot more sort of disabled uh than they were really they a lot of them were like uh paraplegics they uh, paralyzed from the waist down and um yeah and then contracting c diff in hospital which is like the worst shits you can ever imagine uh, people people dying me dying around me left right and center seeing seeing little old grannies in side rooms just being forgotten about yeah just seeing people literally dying in front of you really um yeah it was uh yeah surreal really and then the first sort of two months uh, I, I couldn't talk, so I was on a uh, on a closed track. So I couldn't eat, talk, drink, and uh, that was that was pretty tough. And then things like a bead of sweat running down your forehead and not being able to wipe it, or, or things like that, and just, just not being able to communicate. Just like the worst possible scenario you can ever imagine. And then. Seeing my family around me, seeing my teammates come in and see me, and then seeing other people in other beds who didn't have one visitor from one week to the next. I was very, very fortunate to have some amazing support. And I, I actually had to get a diary eventually to, to book people in to come and see me. And that's how many people I had to come, come and see me. And you know, Martin Johnson coming in and seeing me, Joan Lomu coming in and seeing me in hospital. Uh, the whole Tiger, Tiger squad, my whole England squad, coming in to see me. So I was very, very fortunate. And yeah, I think my dad struggled 
uh, really, really struggled. Uh, he did perfect. My mum was very proactive. Uh, I think my dad just wanted to talk to everybody. My mum just wanted to crack on. And, um, yeah, my dad really, really did struggle and uh, was very, very emotional about it. And I wanted to sort of ease his pain a little bit. And I, I did actually say to myself, Dad, this will make me a better person. And, yeah, I don't think I initially saw that. But then I, I, I think I saw myself in a very sort of privileged situation that I could make a difference and try to... I think what was what was hard is my mates coming in and telling me about nights out they'd, they'd had and games that they played and things like that. And they're obviously trying to gym me up and, and like keep me apart, but sorry, keep me, um, you know, in the loop about what was happening in, in like rugby circles and almost like the gossip. But for me, that was, that was really, really tough uh, because yeah, it sort of dawned on me that I, I wasn't going to get better. Uh, I potentially wasn't going to leave hospital walking and and that was that was really tough and I think as well being on a ventilator as well I was very fortunate to have a consultant who gave me a real long he gave me a real good shot to get off the ventilator then they're leaving hospital on a ventilator that was really really tough because I always wanted to brief brief myself and and improve my situation so when you're when you're a rugby player and when you're an athlete, you go to the gym and you work out and you train hard and you can see the results. But when you're paralysed from the neck down and you can't get off the ventilator, that's tough. That's re- really, really tough because and because there's absolutely nothing you can do about it because of your level of paralysis. So, yeah, it's um, that... That was uh, that was tough, but then I thought, you know, you need to crack on, you need to man up and make make the best of the situation, and you need to start didn't helping your, other um, people. Didn't your mum sort of have a little word with you? Didn't she sort of say, "Look, you've got you've got to get on with it now"? She didn't she give you a little bit of a ultimatum? Did she say something like that? Where she said, "Look, you, you can yeah, well, sit I, here I, while I wait. yeah, well, this this is this, this is very. Yeah, basically, uh, my, my family are very much very proactive, very sort of um, supportive. My, my network of friends as well, they're, they're very much like get on with it. One of my best mates, Dave, uh, David Jones, um, he, he was he's Scottish, so obviously I had my accident. And uh, he texted me that night and he, he heard that I was, I was in hospital and I'd, I'd hurt my neck and he didn't hear anything else of, uh, about it. And he texted me that night saying, how about you, basically, you, you pussy. You need to, you, you need to, uh, yeah, he's like, what, why are you in hospital with sore neck and whatever? And then, and then he found out that I dislocated my neck and I was paralysed with the neck down. I think he felt quite <laughs> guilt, guilty oh. after that point. Yeah, it, was, <laughs> it, was, it, it was absolutely brilliant. But uh, yeah, I still remind him of that every time I see him. But um, yeah, we. Do you know? Do you know what the what made it a lot, lot easier for me is knowing that I had amazing support, but also that people treat me the same. All my network of friends and family treat me as the same old hambo. Really, they didn't. Uh, they probably did feel sorry for me initially, but um, I don't think they ever showed that, and uh, that. That really did help me and it made me sort of make the decision to crack all my life and make the best of this situation and, uh, yeah, try and help people in this situation. Do you, do you find yourself now like a, a more emotionally in tune person having gone through this? Like a more, like a more emotional person? Like have you done a lot of work on mental health stuff through this or have you just literally applied to get on with it, Rule? Uh, yeah, I, I, I'm, a, I'm a hell of a lot better now than what I used to be. I, I think as well, I, I struggle because obviously I've got to have people around me all the time in my care team. And um, I think initially I really, really did struggle with that um, to to understand what people were moaning about. And I did it. Uh, I was I was fairly young when I, when I came home and I had people from different backgrounds and, and some people just very sort of mentally weak and 
different characters around you. When I think when you, the athletes are pretty mentally strong, uh, obviously you have you know guys who are struggle with mental health issues. I think we all struggle with mental health issues in our own way. And I think I initially did struggle with that to have different uh, characters around me, not understanding why. But some people didn't. Uh, I, I don't know. Some people feel sorry for themselves in in, in life in general. I think and, uh, and are the victims really? Um, and I, I had people like that around me. But then I had some amazing people, and I've still got some amazing people who've taught me so much in life. And I think now I've got a lot more sort of empathy in for for people's scenarios and situations really, and, and the way they are in life. And uh, yeah, I'm getting a, getting a bit soft in my old age, I think. But uh, no, I, I I understand them a lot better now. I think I've learned a hell of a lot from a, from a lot of um, a lot of good people as well around me. I think we're even softening the focus around the edges of your um of your frame, Hambo. You're getting you're getting that <laughs> right. gentle in, in, in your. <laughs> Um, I just wanted to ask you, it's it's extraordinary to hear you tell that story. And, and you know, I, I've read so many articles about you in your book and, and obviously seen the wonderful documentary that, that Jim Hamilton's put out. But just sort of chatting to you about it is, it's sort of incredibly revealing. Um, we had Ed Jackson on um, a couple of weeks ago who mentioned about some of the dark humour that had got him through and the fact that somebody had given him a pair of uh, three juggling mm. balls about 24 hours after he'd had his accident. I yeah. just wondered if there was, you mentioned obviously David, your Scottish friend, but if there was dark humour that got you through, particularly from some of that Leicester clique, um, or whether actually just, you know, times and places, it, it, it was never that appropriate. Yeah, I remember Harry Ellis coming into hospital and um, he said, Hambo, <laughs> that, you know this story? I don't know if you know this story. No, he said, Hambo, I've got your DVD. And he like looked at me and winked at me. And I think it was just like a normal DVD cover. I don't know what it was. I think it was just just some sort of film. So I got to a, got to like, I, I didn't think anything of it. I got to like a Sunday afternoon. I was with my mum and dad used to come in at the weekend. So I was, I was with my mum on a, on a Sunday. And we uh, looked, looked inside the DVD case so we asked, we watch a film. Yeah, yeah, we'll watch a film. Looked inside it and it was something like Debbie Does Dallas or whatever in there. He thought he would hook me up with some porn. But uh, yeah, it didn't really go down too well with my mum. But uh, I was like, oh, fat, fat, thanks for that hazard. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Very good. I think that wins. I think that trumps juggling balls. Juggling balls of a different kind, yeah. I suppose. Um, <laughs> amazing, amazing. So, so tell me a bit more about, you know, where, where did Get Busy Living come from? And, and at what point did you start channeling, I suppose, your frustrations, but your energies into, right, this is, this is going to be for a better cause and, and I'm, I, I want to make something of this? So it's obviously the message, Get Busy Living or Get Busy Dying. And uh, the message comes from Shawshank Redemption. I remember Paul Kimmage coming in and seeing me, and he, he basically asked me what my favourite film was. And I said, sure, obviously, Shawshank Redemption. And he sort of took a lot of sort of parities with uh, my my accident and my story with uh, Shawshank Redemption. And that's where the that's where the sort of message comes along. Yeah, comes from. It's been an amazing um, sort of success, really. Tins, what was it about the foundation that, that you got involved in? And, and tell us a bit more for those who don't know, you know, why it's made such an impact in your role. Oh, I, look, obviously, it starts from the, the person that Hambo is in, in terms of how infectious he is and how he's decided to take that positivity and, and obviously listening to him talk and how humble he is. And then he infects he infects that on other people obviously set up the found uh, the get busy living center was always for people who have suffered catastrophic injuries through um through sport and he wants to be it doesn't matter where you are in the world i mean we've brought people hambo's brought people back from south africa from uh, all over europe with people who've had these accidents whether it be school uh, school people on um on tour or or wherever and get them back and be the first point of call. And what the what the get busy living is is a place where you you can you can go and actually try and get better yourself. You know, there's a beneficiary. Uh, it's Daniel, isn't it? Daniel Harvey, who um, and he was told that he would 
never walk again. And then eventually he came into he came into the Hamburg Foundation. And then four weeks later, he was taking his first steps with crutches. So it's that setting that ability that you you ha- you're there to push yourselves as far as you can. And then downstairs with the living room, it's it's it is basically mental health. But the the, the, the sofa area Hambo is basically for the mental health side of it, not just for the guys when they're sat there hanging out, eating, sharing experiences of what they've gone through, how to solve problems, whether it I'm just whether it be ventilator, whether it be wheelchair, but also for the families who come with them and the families can talk to families who've been through it. And actually, when you, as you said, if you, if you never have really been through it, you can't, yes, you sympathise, but you can't really offer pointful advice, whereas I think what, what Hambo's created in terms of how the whole centre works is it allows people to share experiences and maybe take if there is a new beneficiary there, take the edge off their parents about all their worries and to share knowledge and how this was handled, how did that handle. Um, and what Hambo tries to empower in everyone else is that they lead the next generation. They'll they'll be the mentors for the next guys, and he's just the godfather who sits at the top and surveys his everything he's built he he's on to the next the next building the accommodation the hydro and then after that they'll be, i'm sure his brain must be at the moment sat at home just being able to think of things that he wants to do next uh, i'm sure there's a lot more steps that are going, going to come into it but that's how it works is is it's for beneficiaries to then push it out that they hear about this this great center which is just all about good people doing trying to help each other get through a shitty situation really Matt, how, again, I don't mean to be a curious question, but how proud are you of everything you have achieved in the last 15 years about Get Busy Living Centre, about the foundation, and about, in, in in almost its purest form, about the inspiration that you've given to so many? Yeah, yeah, I am proud of that. I think the, the proudest thing for me is seeing our beneficiaries communicate with each other and support each other. I think that's the most important thing. And I, I think as well now... That what's really really important it's called it's called the Matt Hampson Foundation but it's not just me on my own now uh, we've got a lot of beneficiaries who are doing amazing things um, George Robinson for instance he he's on sex education he he, he was uh, he, he played he played a massive role in the in the, in the last series and he's uh, going to go on to be an absolute rock star uh, we've got guys like uh, Henry Love as well he he's a uh, He's a DJ, and uh, he's he's just started to uh, get back into DJ, and he's doing like live sets. I know you're into your DJ, not your Haskell, yeah. and uh, yeah. He's sorry, you can't promote any, you can't promote any of the DJs on this platform. I yeah, Haskell, sorry, Haskell, sorry I'm I'm sorry, have to come. Was in the contract. Was in the contract. No rival business side, is allowed on get, here. Yeah, get that out. We'll talk about the bloke from Sex Education, but DJs, <laughs> fucking calm down, <laughs> Hambo. Maybe we should do like a um a house rugby live from there one day or something. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Try and tie it in with the two Alangi barbecue, which would be uh, then food would never be an issue. Yeah, well, I'm sure we can have, I'm sure we can have an Umu up there, and uh, yeah, get Umu. get Freddie and uh, Manu and uh, Henry over as well from France. So yeah, I'm sure we can we can eat a lot of pig that night. <laughs> <laughs> Hask is going to need to change his shorts, I think, at the mention of the two Alangi clan. Um, <laughs> I just want to sort of sum up, Hambo, with a sort of a final question. Your relationship with rugby now, how would, how would you describe it? I, w- I would say my relationship with rugby is pretty healthy. Uh, I'm not... I, lo- I love rugby, uh, but I do understand that it is just a game now. And I don't mean to sort of just... You know, I don't, I don't mean to sort of tone rugby down and uh, make it sound like it's not you know, not an amazing sport that supported me so much, but uh, I understand that it is a sport, and you've got to you've got to understand that there's obviously a lot more, um, yeah, a lot more going on in the world at the moment, especially uh, than just sport. And uh, uh, I think, um, yeah, the rugby fraternity has been unbelievable. The support I received has been quite remarkable really and continues to be it just grows and grows and grows and yeah I cut myself very lucky to have that and people support have supported me so so much and, and just are relentless in in supporting me and my foundation and, and always want to 
continue to do that. And I, I, I just count myself very lucky to have that support. Matt, can I ask, sorry, Alex, I just start, can I ask that, obviously with, you know, because rugby was so important to you and because of what you've said, even on this, on this, on this show this evening, did you try once you're able to, to like, uh, to, to stay involved with rugby as much as possible, thinking that that was going to kind of fill the hole that you had. Uh, and then you realise that actually later on, there is so much more to it and that actually probably being around it wasn't going to make things better. Because, I, you know, I, I found when, I think we talked about the show, when I, you know, when I retired, obviously very, very different circumstances, you know, you kind of want to be involved. You feel like you're missing out or you, you want to be there. And actually then, the greatest revelation is that you, you, it's great to become a fan and actually remove yourself from from trying to live it, if you know what I mean. Yeah, absolutely. Um, when, I, when I initially had my accident, I was obviously 20 years old. So my mates were coming into hospital telling me stories about what they'd been up to and how what they did in rugby and whatever. And, and you just miss that so, so much. You miss that camaraderie and the friendships and all of that and then once your friends become a little bit older and they retire as well um, you can start talking to them about the bigger picture and I think uh, when you're when you're a sports star and when you're when you're playing rugby things are you know you're so selfish and quite self-centered in a lot of ways and then which is rightly so you have to be like to be the best but um, you come out of that environment and you see that, yeah, you see the bigger picture. And I, I saw the bigger picture um, when I was a lot, lot younger um, because obviously from my experiences and my, and my life and the way that it sort of panned out and obviously rugby's amazing, amazing support and it, and it gives you the sort of kudos and the, and the opportunities in life. But it's not the be all and end all in it in everything, and I think um, yeah, it really does hit home when when you do retire. How there is so many more important things out there than than just sport, but the friendships forged and the and the people that you meet through rugby, you you're so so lucky with, and um, you'll never forget that, and you never forget those memories. Abba, you are a, a true inspiration. Who'd have thought from Tuesday Night Fight Club at OG <laughs> to a, a sporting saint of sorts? Um, I, I mean, we've we've had a number of fascinating guests on on this podcast over the last two years, but you have been, without a doubt, the most inspirational and just, uh, you know, an absolute superstar to have on. Um, just before we go, Tins, I'm going to lay down the challenge to you to move from the, uh, the most inspirational man in rugby <laughs> seamlessly through to your bin juice 15. I mean, you know, I said to Cy, can we sat this just off? And he said, no, we've got to do it. I was like, how the fuck do you segue from a guy who's just told the most remarkable life story <laughs> and a guy who's an inspiration to everyone in the game through to Tins and his bin juice 15. But that is your segue. This is your cue. Um, it better be good oh, to match perfect. up Hask. Go. Oh, that's uh, House of Rugby. Hask's bin juice was, was a good bin juice, to be fair. Um, I'm going to count backwards. At 15, I've got a guy called Stuart Bellinger. Nickname was CD. Um, he had two seasons at Bath, uh, six appearances, but was always up for going out, hence the name CD. He got into some, himself into all sorts of problems. Really, really nice, nice guy. guy. F- CD Bell. 14, Carl Price. I think we thought we'd signed Leon Price. Uh, and we oh, got his, his bigger, not-so-good brother. He was there for two seasons and had three appearances. Um, was the ultimate bid use because he didn't even like training. Um, he, he was great for the lads in terms of getting them KFC or any other sort of uh, uh, fast food. Otherwise, yeah, didn't offer much. 13, Rudy Kyle, the ultimate bid juice hardest trainer literally would carry around a duffel bag of implements that he could use for stretching so if you ever needed like a a golf ball to loosen off anything he had it if you needed a foam roller he had three in his bag if you needed tape he had his own tape supply he had his own ralgic supply he had everything he was the but ultimate nice guy called the big guy hey big guy he used to call everyone big guy Rudy Carl, yeah, unbelievable, unbelievable hair. Guy. Incredible hair. 
made made the uh, made the bad uh, bad mistake of going against Keith Senior in a in a league versus Union code and got a four straight forearm literally destroyed his face uh, but he's rebuilt it which is always good uh, 12 Spencer Davy uh, really nice lad ended up at Newcastle uh, he was sort of coming through the ranks when I was there ultimate team player love going out also had a sort of Jason Leonard sized problem which uh, involves his testicles which was always good for the lads and, and, and he had no harm in showing everyone either uh, 11 I've gone controversially for an international bin juice and that's Leon Lloyd a, such a quality player but never got he was always on tours, but then he'd get on the pitch and he'd get yellow carded, or he'd get, and he never actually, he never actually got as many caps as he should have got because he would always get sent off. So good I've done, scrapper, uh, ironically, well. good scrapper, good scrapper, scrapper as well. As well. Yeah. Yeah. well, I told you that, told, told you the story about, about when we were up at before, before the, uh, the uh, before, uh, before, uh, before, before the Scotland, Scotland game, game, the guy, the guy poured vodka on his head, head literally oh, yes. before he knew it. The guy was up against the wall. Does he still wear a cougar his... arm guard on a night out in Edinburgh? Right? <laughs> 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 Would you imagine he just the jacket comes off and it's there? At ten, we've got Carlos Spencer. At ten, literally ultimate bid juice when he came to Gloucester. We once played a game. All he did was shape in the gym. So he did loads of weights, not one single hair on his whole body. Uh, literally walked around the gym with his top off, just lifting weights. He w- we were once playing in a game and someone didn't drop him through a hole where he would have scored. He walked in. He carried on running his line. He was about 15 metres out from the try line, ran all the way through the post, turned around and sat on the hoardings for three and a half minutes whilst play was still going on. He was our fly half at the time. Sat there, wait, just literally staring at the guy who didn't pass in the ball. Uh, so yeah, so he was ultimate bin juice when he came. Nine, Andy Williams, a uh, great, great guy at Bath. Uh, it was early days when I was there. The ultimate Kino would do anything for the lads. You could ring him at four in the morning and say, I'm stuck in Bristol. He'd come pick you up. Uh, ended up getting five caps for Wales. Just the nicest guy on the planet. Ben Sternum at eight, just Mr. Boom. The only man who could, in an international that you're losing 76 nil, make a big tackle and stand over the guy and go, boom! You've been sterminated. Oh, no. 76 nil on the tour of hell against Australia. Don't do that, Sturge. Um, right. At seven, James Merriman uh, played Wales Sevens, ultimate team player, hardest working man. Probably didn't get the games that he did because uh, Hazy was there and he was always behind Hazy, but just ultimate team player. Uh, six, Tom Barlow. You always need a serial killer at six. Never spoke. But if you ever got in any trouble in a nightclub, you wouldn't even know he was there, but he would just appear out the shadows and like just bonk someone on the head and then he'd disappear again. Uh, but you always need him around. Just make sure you had both eyes on him. Never leave him uh, by himself. Five, John Pendlebury. Uh, played for Bath. Um, then came to Gloucester. Just the hardest working ultimate team man. Great on the night out. Good northern lad. Loves Training hard, loves everything. Number four, Dan Smith, the ultimate bin juice, called Test Match, tried to be Borthers when he was like 19 years old, um, and literally trying to boss Danny Grucock, all these guys around, literally. He was at Bath for five years and played one game. Uh, 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 and he did some, but he was good off the field. He did some, he basically did something that ruined his his, his career <laughs> right from the get go. I know the story as well. Social, but we can never share the story uh, in any way or like, but it go definitely on, ruined his it, career. Like, like Uncle Bryn, it's like what happened it, on the boat trip. I promise you, this you can't, even up, you can't share. I'll tell you off. I'll tell you off. Uh, but I'm not do- doing it on, uh, on air. Uh, at three, there's a guy called Paul Shadbolt, um, proper East End. Uh, wind- uh, he was a uh, he was a window cleaner. Um, literally, don't know where we found him from. Came up to Bath and, and played unbelievable rig. Literally, he would run Dozer close for. Uh, uh, tanned, lean, and whatever it is, BLT, big, lean, and tanned, literally ripped to shreds. Great player, but uh, literally, he wouldn't he'd be getting, he would do it for the love of the game, wasn't getting paid that much from Bath, would go around cleaning the guy's windows to make money and stuff whilst training and doing everything else. He was incredible. Lived with me on my floor. He didn't even want a bed, he just slept on the floor. Um, at two, Jeremy Paul, another controversial one, obviously, World Cup winner. Um, Big dates in your bin juice. Literally came and did nothing at Gloucester. 
huge reputation, even pulled the forwards aside because he figured Hoggy out. So if you ask Hoggy questions, he forgets to actually do the session. He just ends up talking and going through technique and stuff. So HP, uh, JP would normally come in with a severe hangover. And so they go out on the field to do a forward session and he would just talk to uh, Hoggy about technique, how what happens if this happens? What and Hoggy would talk for sixty minutes about what you should do, and then it'd be like the fitness guy come out, right? Session's over, and Hoggy realizes he's actually got no work done, but JP's happy. The hangover's gone for another day, um, and then at one, there's a guy called Lawrence Ovens, just trained, never seemed to play, never really spoke. Again, one you had to keep your eye on because you weren't inta- exactly sure what was going to happen. But then you get him on a team social, and he was good. He was a good lad. There's my binge. That binge. is an outstanding effort. Very good homework. Not, it was, wasn't quite up to Hasp, but it was a go. And some very good ones in there. And literally, that was, I think, your finest uh, your finest binge juice 15. I think we only had 72 literallys in there. So um, it's done well to, to limit those. <laughs> um, Lord, very good work. Those out, so edit those out, please, Si. No, no, we keep them all in. It's the fun of the fair. It's literal bingo. <laughs> Um, any other business this week? Hamba, let's give um, your, your, your bits a plug. Um, for those who haven't, and bloody well should, uh, Engage, still available, all good book re- retailers, available to download, audio book. How do we get hold of your book at this, um, at this point in time? Yeah, yeah, you can still get it on Amazon or any good or bad bookshop. And, that, and the foundation just continues to go from strength to strength. The website is? Um, MattAnsonFoundation.org. So, yeah, just have a look at that and just see what we're doing, really. Um, we're, we're pretty active on social media as well. Obviously, not as active as has the brand. But, uh, yeah. <laughs> that's, that's, you know, that's his nickname, nickname mate. mate. We do, we do. We've yes. been there many times before. He keeps having it taken out of the shows, but he will forever be the brand in our yeah. eyes. And our oh, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. um, and it's a brilliant knife on which to finish. I'm very glad you boxed him up and put him away uh, in the finale. <laughs> Hask, we don't often blow smoke um, around our guests, but just a word on the man we've had on tonight. Yeah, look, I think, um, it, you know, it's pretty clear for, for a lot of people that, that Matt is, is an inspiration. Um, I think, you know, I've, I've talked about it many times. He, he's sick of it, and I, but I'll always keep saying it. I think, you know, he's an inspiration for me. He's an inspiration for lots of people. I think what he's, he's handled his, uh, his journey better than, than anyone I could imagine. Uh, I, I think he's a shining light uh, for, for people to follow. And, you know, my career is what it is and has been what it has, you know, has been the way it was because of things I learned from Matt and the way he continues to apply himself and, and to make sure you take every single opportunity and to never, ever sit back. Um, and I think the get, you know, get busy living, uh, center is, is, is incredible. I'm very, you know, very much looking forward to, to checking it out. And I think, you know, uh, you know, the foundation continues to, to help and it's really important that we, we, we keep supporting it. And I think, you know, the, the fact is, you wouldn't get the kind of people supporting Matt if he wasn't a good bloke and didn't do things in, in a right way. And as I said, you know, I, c- I can barely fit into his busy diary, you know, with all the with all the celebs that he's got and all the and all the big timers. So, um, you know, I think you know if anyone's interested in Matt's stories and definitely read the book, definitely watch the documentary, keep supporting him and and keep being an amazing example, Matt. Thank you so much for for coming on the show. No worries at all, lad. It's been a pleasure been really good to have you on thank you so much look after yourself but thank you so much for your honesty tonight and, and your insight and um you know keep keep working your magic um what an amazing show absolutely amazing show um a truly inspirational story and lord your guinness perfect pour bin juice has sort of yeah well it completed the job well done to you for that um that is it for this week thank you so much to matt thank you so much to all of you for watching for listening uh, don't forget, you can dig into our entire back catalogue on podcast or YouTube, and you can talk about your favourite shows on the Facebook group as well, should you so desire. Thank you to Tins, thank you to Hask, and thank you in particular to the wonderful Matt Hampson. Stay safe, everybody out there. Look after yourselves. We'll see you on Thursday with the third of our House of Rugby shorts, and we'll be back next Tuesday with Hask and Tins delivering their visions for the global game. God help us all. <laughs> uh, until then, be good. Thank you once again to Hambo, uh, and we'll be seeing you soon. Bye for now. You've been watching the House of Rugby on Joe, together with Guinness. Drink responsibly. Visit drinkaware.co.uk for the facts.